Okay, so um, all right, so it's Christmas Eve, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach about Christmas. Hopefully it didn't shock you that <laughs> I'm going to preach on this. But, um, you know, I, I, I kind of do preach on the same thing every year, but, I kinda, but there's always a different group of people uh, in the audience every year. So, um, and one thing my wife and I were talking about just on the way over was even though, you know, I, I, own this, I, I have thoughts about Christmas and I'll share those in a moment. But um, one thing that's good about Christmas is at least, you know, in a places like Australia, there is a time where people stop and they do recognise that this was a Christian holiday at some point in time. And at least gives you the opportunity to, to talk about Jesus in the workplace and whatnot. And even, even a couple of days ago, I was able to share the gospel with one of my colleagues because we were talking about Christmas. They asked if I celebrated Christmas and the conversation sort of went on from there. But what we were talking about on the way over in the car is that we kind of like, I do sort of like Christmas events, even though I don't really make a big deal about Christmas. I do like when there are like Christmas carol events and, you know, we were talking about like the kids, you know, usually the kids do the skit and they act out the nativity and they act out the birth of Jesus and, and just sort of retelling that story each year in a memorable way so that you grow up learning that. It's just that the problem is when they learn that story now, it's always wrong. There's always things wrong with it, right? There's always the events are in the wrong order or then they, 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 all the people have long hair for some reason. Um, just, just, and, and the nativity scene is always wrong. So that's what I wanted to talk about today, just before I, I, I talk about, um, that's what I want to talk about later, uh, but first just give you my thoughts about the holiday season myself. But today, the main part of the sermon is going to be just going through the passages of scripture and going over what actually happened and the order of events that happened. Because even though the birth of Jesus is a very familiar story to everybody, we know there are shepherds, we know an angel visited Mary, we know an angel visited Joseph, we know that there were wise men that visited Jesus, but do you, do you know that the, the order of events, like how it actually happened? It might just be a blur to you, you don't really know how, what happened one after another uh, until Jesus was born. So that's what I'm going to sort of focus on today, just giving you that timeline of events that I believe it happened. And as hopefully as a church, as we understand the story better, then when we go out and learn and see Christmas being celebrated, we can at least correct the wrong doctrine with our children and start there. And uh, hopefully we can start to change and educate people the, the true Christmas story. But if you were to ask me, you know, what, what's my thoughts about Christmas? I'll just give my thoughts really quickly. But this verse here in Romans 14.5, I think this sums it up for me, how I feel about this holiday season and public holidays and, and special days where people say, oh, this, you know, this should be a day to remember Jesus' birth and should be a day where we set aside. Like Michael prayed, I think every day should be like that. There should be no day that's you know, honoured one above another. But some people do, and there's nothing wrong with that. Romans 14.5 says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I was talking with uh, Tim just today out solving, just about convictions, right? And, you know, people have these convictions, like they feel like, hey, this, you know, like, for example, Sunday should just be one day where I don't work and I just focus on Jesus. If they want to esteem one day above another, you know, you know, that's let them fully be persuaded in their own mind. It's just something that some people like to do and others, you know, every day is the same to them. Um, and the Bible's just saying here, hey, you know, if that's what you feel is right to do, that's what you're persuaded to do, then that's fine. You know, this is one of those doubtful disputations. So, you know, when it comes to, to I'll just touch briefly on just Christmas traditions. So I don't, you know, I don't have a problem with people celebrating Christmas. Sometimes when you don't make a big deal about Christmas, uh, people think, oh, you know, are you like a Jehovah's Witness? Or are you somebody that, you know, doesn't, you know, you don't like but celebrating birthdays, you don't like celebrating um, these special events. But no, it's just because I it's just esteem every day alike. It's, it's no different to me. It doesn't have to be on a certain day. But so I'm not, I'm not against it. I'm not fully for it either. It's just, it doesn't really bother me. I do think it's nice that, that the country does spend some time remembering this. But I'm not so adamant to the point where I'm going to claim that it was a Christian holiday because it 
traditionally it wasn't. You know, it wasn't. It was a day that was, you know, of pagan origin. And then eventually the day, the same day was used to celebrate the birth of Christ. So this idea that Jesus was born on the 25th of December is completely false. I think we all know that, right? We don't know the date of Jesus' birth. A lot of people believe that it's not even the right time of the year because, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's winter and they wouldn't be, you know, watching over, the shepherds wouldn't be watching over their flocks by night. They would have the, you know, the sheep, you know, maybe in a barn or something because it was too cold out. So they think it was probably at the other side of the year that he was born when it was warmer. But, you know, a lot of people have different traditions. You know, you've got the Christmas tree and, you know, people go, try and go to Jeremiah 10 saying the Christmas tree is this idol and it's of pagan practice. And I've preached sermons on this before. I'm not really going to go into that. But I don't believe the Christmas tree is what Jeremiah 10 is talking about. Um, a lot of people say, oh, you know, pagan festivals and whatnot. People like to give gifts and they like to have feasts. And, and this is what makes Christmas bad and we shouldn't be celebrating Christmas. But th there's nothing wrong with giving gifts. I mean, G God gave us a gift, right? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's nothing wrong with giving gifts. There's nothing wrong with celebrating feasts. I mean, God had feasts that celebrated certain events and made people think of certain things. So these traditions in and of themselves are not pagan. But often people just, you know, they just don't like people celebrating Christmas for some reason. They just don't like it because they believe it's of pagan origin and they want to just find reasons for people to not have these uh, meaningful traditions that they've, you know, that they decide to celebrate. So they have the tree and the gifts and, and they assign meanings to them to help really people to remember and to reflect and to teach their children. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, there is something wrong with Santa Claus, right? There is something wrong with Santa Claus and the reindeer, Rudolph the reindeer, because that has, you know, that has nothing to do with Jesus, right? Like, you know, the, the whole Santa Claus idea of him flying around and giving presents. And so we were just at the shops yesterday, and the guy at the fish shop said to, to, to Simon, oh, what is Santa Claus going to give you? And what did Simon say? He goes, Santa Claus isn't real. And I like that. I like it when Simon believes that and, and understands that Santa Claus isn't real, it's fake. And, you know, I, I personally don't want anything to do with Santa Claus. You know, I'll never, you know, it always boggles my mind when Christians, they want to buy Santa hats and dress up their kids like elves. You'll never see me buying the Rudolph reindeer nose or the reindeer headband. Because, you know what, because I, I don't want to spend my money promoting a lie. Right? Like, I'm not going to use my heart and my... God's given me talent. He's given me ability to go out and make money. I'm not going to use that money to perpetuate and commercialize a lie. Right? And then keep buying all these things. So I'll never buy, like, the, ro the, the reindeer shirt or the Santa shirt. You know, the shirts that say, ho, ho, ho. Or, you know, buying a, the Santa hat, you know, and things like that. Because Christmas, if we're going to make Christmas about something to do with Jesus' birth. What has it got to do with elves and Santa Claus and reindeer? Now, I was at Roselands the other day, and um, they have a nativity scene set up, right? And this is why I, I sort of wanted to preach on this topic again, because even though, even though the Christmas story is so familiar, I'm sure many of you, and maybe not you guys that have heard me preach on this topic before, but maybe you'll walk past a nativity scene like this and just think, oh, it's a nativity scene, it's the birth of Jesus. But you don't realise what's actually wrong with this picture, that it's not actually biblically accurate. But then this is the picture we see all the time of Jesus' birth. What do you see at the nativity scene, right? The nativity scene, you see Jesus, you know, the, the baby Jesus lying in a maid. But here he's not wrapped in anything, right? He's just lying open. Right? But what does the Bible say? The Bible says he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So he's not wrapped. But what you'll notice here is, see, on the, on the left here, I, know you see this. I thought this guy was Joseph, right? But then he's got, the, he's got the shepherd's staff, right? So this is actually the shepherd, right, with the two sheep. And then these, you know, people always believe that there were three kings, right, because of that song, We Three Kings of Orient Art, which is not accurate because we don't know how many people there were. But the, these guys I know are the kings because they actually have the gifts that they're holding. So I thought maybe this was Joseph, but then he's holding a gift. So I'm just like, where's, jo where's Joseph in this nativity scene? It's like, no Joseph, it's just Mary, right? And, and Jesus not wrapped, right? And then you have the shepherd and the kings all in the same scene, which we'll see in a moment is not true either. That the kings did not come, well, the, sorry, the wise men, yeah, I'm saying kings, been so brainwashed. So the wise men 
actually didn't come at the same time the shepherds came to see Jesus. I don't know if you guys know this, but we're going to go into the Bible a bit later to see why this scene is false. There's no Joseph, no wrapping. You know, the, wi the wise men are here with the shepherds, which is not true. Um, and, and, you know, Joseph is not in the picture. Uh, some other nativity scenes you'll see as well. You'll see angels at the top, kind of there at the birth too, right? So what they've kind of done is like they've bring all these elements to, to create this scene, but this is not what actually happened in the Bible. And, um, you know, it's just frustrating that, you know, that, you know, yeah, I mean, Christmas is already about Santa Claus and Rudolph and reindeers and, and elves and whatnot. And then the little bit that there is left of Jesus' birth is, is false, you know, is, is promoted. What, what is known and what people see in these nativity scenes um, is always false. So I think at least if we learn today what is true, what is the true Christmas story, then at least we can teach that to, that to our kids. And it would be great one day if, you know, there was, you know, either a, 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 a cartoon or a video or somebody made that was actually accurate, you know, and it had, had the Bible verses. I don't know if you guys have seen this movie that was created, but it was called The Gospel of John. It was, it was based on uh, like sort of a liberal translation of the Bible, something like similar to the message, right? But um, what was really cool about this movie, it was like a three-hour movie. It was literally just a reading of the Bible, right? So there was a narrator that read parts of the Bible, but when you know, Jesus would say something or somebody in the story would say something, they would actually say those lines of that Bible translation. I just thought it was really well done. It looked really professional. Like even when I, I was watching a bit of it last night because I was just thinking about this sermon, I was showing my wife a bit. I, it still moves me, that story, because I think the acting was so powerful, right? The acting was really good. You can, Go check it out. I think it's a pretty good sh um, show to watch, uh, a good movie to watch. So it's the wrong Bible translation. And, and the other problem with it is, you know, it's just long-haired Jesus, long-haired disciples, that sort of thing. So... I don't know, I was trying to look up where this whole idea of these long-haired Israelites came from, and, and you know, I don't know where it came from, but historically they say that obviously Israelites would not have long hair because the Bible in 1 Corinthians says that it's a shame for a man to have long hair, and you wouldn't pray to God having long hair, right? Just You're dishonouring your head, yet they have this long-haired Jesus in these Jesus movies praying to God, right? It's dishonouring to Jesus Christ. So... It would be nice one day, you know, if there was, a, if there was an accurate story that was on, you know, and, and an accurate movie, because it would be timeless. If there was, if there was you know, an, a movie that actually accurately portrayed the gospel and it was using the King James Bible, I mean, that is a movie that you could watch over and over again because it could actually teach your children as well as if it was also done in a way that was engaging and entertaining. So let's just spend the next, you know, half an hour or so. Let's go through the verses Let's, let's, let's learn the story for how it actually happened in the Bible and then you'll know when you see a Jesus movie or a Jesus TV series or a nativity scene, you'll know uh, what was true and what was false. So let's just first of all start at Luke 1, right? So Luke, the events of Luke 1 happened first and you'll notice that when, when, we, when we look at them, they actually sort of intertwine. So you've got the birth of Jesus happens in Luke 1 and Luke 2 and then also in, in Matthew 1 and Matthew 2. And they kind of interlock when you see how they actually work. So in, first of all, we'll go to, to Luke 1 and we'll go to where Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, actually visits Mary. So in Luke 1, we read here, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, six, if, you, if you read, if you go back and read the beginning of Luke 1, that's the, 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 the annunciation of John the Baptist, right? Where the angel comes to Zechariah in the temple and then he doesn't really believe them, right? So then he can't speak up until John the Baptist is born. So that's happening before. So then Elizabeth, who's Zacharias' wife, she now knows she's going to give birth. So the Bible says she hides herself for five months. So that's, this happens six months previous to when uh, Mary is told that she's going to give birth to Jesus Christ. Her cousin, Elizabeth, who's married to Zacharias, is already pregnant with John the Baptist for six months. So if you didn't know that, John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus Christ as a, as a man. So it says here, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So this is where they're living at first. They're living in Nazareth, right? That's, that's where... Um, 
Mary and Joseph are living. Now, that's not where Jesus was born, right? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So we'll learn soon why they moved. Now, one thing that's interesting as well about the different accounts of the birth is that this is the only time that the name of this angel is given. So I don't know if it's always Gabriel all the time. Like, was, was, was it Gabriel that went to Zacharias? Was it Gabriel that went to Joseph? Was it Gabriel that, you know, because there's all these angelic appearings, right? And even the angel of the Lord came to the shepherds, right? Was that Gabriel as well? We don't always know, but I just thought I'd point that out. That this, is the, this is the only time that you actually know the angel's name, but we don't know if it's always the same angel, right? Because there are many different angels. Um, and that's another thing with the nativity scene that I think is wrong as well, because I don't believe angels have wings. You know, angels look like men. They're not beings that have wings. It's the seraphims and the cherubs, when we learned about Satan, that have wings. So that's another thing, because the nativity scene, you normally have these little cupid baby-looking things with wings on them, right? And that's not what angels look like. They don't look like midgets, or they don't look like babies. They look like men, right? And they're not just flying around with arrows kind of thing. So, six month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph and of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So, he's espoused to, uh, Joseph is espoused to Mary, and we know from the Bible that even though you're espoused to somebody, which is something a bit stronger than what we would consider engagement, you're, they're considered their wife, you know, an espoused woman sleeps with somebody else she's actually put to death right because she's committing adultery because she's actually somebody's wife but at this point in time how i understand the story is that they're not actually living together they're actually living separately even though they're espoused to one another so what i believe what, what's happening here in luke 1 at this time they're, they're both living in in nazareth i believe because obviously you know she, the ga angel gabriel goes to galilee named nazareth you know, and, and they're there together, but they're not actually living together yet. That's what I think. Um, but they're espoused, right? So they're kind of like, a, it's a stronger sort of engagement. Um, and they're both living up uh, there in Nazareth. Now, Na Nazareth, if you didn't know, I was just getting this map of the ancient Israel. Nazareth is up here, right? So this is the Sea of Galilee, and Nazareth is up here. Judea is this section down here. And if you can see on this map, that's Jerusalem, right? And that's Bethlehem. Right, and, we'll, and we'll see that a bit later. So this distance here, if you measure it on Google Maps, now if you're a flat earther, you might not believe those distances. But if you look on Google Maps, right, that distance is about 150 kilometers. Right? So if you put in walking from there to there, it's like a day's journey or something like that. So that'll give you an idea of what that distance is. So it is possible to travel from here to here. You're traveling on a camel or something like that and, and get there in half a day. Uh, it's, not, it's not so far that it's, it's impossible to, to go by foot that you would need to fly or something like that. All right, we'll go back to that map as we go through these stories. It says, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. So the angel comes to Mary and says, Hey, you're, you're going to be blessed, you're highly favoured. And this is why she responds this way and says, And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. So what is that saying? That's saying the angels come to her saying, hey, you're a blessed woman, and she's basically wondering, why is this angel come to visit me? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. So this is when Mary learns that she is going to conceive and bring forth a son. And, and this is maybe why she's so shocked, right? Because she's not living with Joseph. She's not living with Joseph at the time. She's living, you know, probably still in her father's house. She's a spouse to Joseph, but because they're not living together, it's kind of like, well, you know, how can I conceive when I've not been with anybody? So then the angel goes on to tell her, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. So there was that controversy online, right, with Sam Gibbs saying that Jesus shouldn't have been called Jesus. He was meant to be called Emmanuel. But see, it wasn't, it wasn't Joseph and Mary that decided to call Jesus Jesus, right? They were told by the angel, this is what you're going to call him right and shall call his name jesus he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the lord god shall give unto him the throne of his father david and he shall reign over the house of jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end so there's prophecy of jesus christ then said mary unto the angel 
how shall this be seeing i know not a man so not only was she not living with jesus uh, not living with joseph she was a virgin right so she's saying here how can i give birth to a, a baby when i've never slept with anybody that's what she's saying here and the angel answered and said unto her the holy ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of god and we learned just recently what makes jesus a unique son of god because physically he was born of god as opposed to us spiritually being born of god or adam being created directly by god so this is why um, he's called the son of god because the holy ghost conceived him in the womb he was born directly of god physically luke 1 36 and behold thy cousin elizabeth she hath also conceived a son in her old age and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren now they're living in different parts right because zachariah served in the temple in jerusalem so if you remember that map you know her cousin is living down here right in jerusalem and she's living up in nazareth so the angel is telling her hey your your cousin who you also know is barren she's also now conceived as well so they're, they're getting this message but they haven't actually talked to each other right they don't know that each other is pregnant so the angel's telling her hey your your cousin also has has conceived and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren for with god nothing shall be impossible and mary said behold the handmaid of the lord i just like this this when mary says this because it shows the faith of mary yeah we don't worship mary like the catholics but she was a very faithful woman in the sense that she was approached by this angel the angel said this was going to happen and she believed it straight away we see this in joseph's story as well when he's approached by the angel he's believing the word of god immediately and acting on it and it shows that these were people of great faith so she just says behold the handmaid of the lord it's sort of like here am i lord send me you know here am i i'm ready to do what you want me to do be it unto me according to thy word and the angel departed from her see we ought to have that sort of spirit in us when we hear the word of god we know god wants us to do something to be ready to say hey here am i send me luke 1 39 mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. So now that she's heard that Elizabeth is six months pregnant, she's going to go see her cousin, right? She's going to go stay with her cousin, maybe help her out. So we can see here that she cared about her family as well. So she's now travelled. I don't know whether she's travelling on her own or whatever. But she's, oh, sorry. she's now travelling from Nazareth all the way down to Jerusalem because that's where Zacharias is, where he's serving in the temple, right? And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary... The babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, keep this in mind that Elizabeth doesn't know that Mary has, is going to conceive of the Holy Ghost, right? So, because that was shown of Mary. So this shows that this is a supernatural event that's sort of happening here, that Mary comes in, says hello, the salutation of Mary, right? She's saying hello to Elizabeth. And it's saying here that as soon as she heard, as soon as Elizabeth heard Mary say hello, john the baptist in her womb at six months old leaps in the womb right and then elizabeth is then just filled with the holy ghost and then starts preaching the word of god and she spake out with a loud voice and said blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb and whence is this to me that the mother of my lord should come to me so now she knows right not even by mary telling elizabeth elizabeth just knows because the, the, the holy spirit has revealed it to her that she's going to give birth to the lord jesus christ right the mother of my lord should come to me because she's going to give birth physically to the lord jesus christ now i skipped a couple of verses here just down to 56 because after that then we see the birth of john the baptist right in the rest of luke 1 where basically john, you know they were going to call john the baptist zacharias after his father but then the mom says, no, 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 his name shall be John. And then they bring a writing table over to Zacharias and then he writes John. And when he does that, then he's able to speak again, right? Now, in verse 56, it says here, And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. So you remember, she was in Nazareth. She was told, hey, you're going to give birth to the Lord Jesus, right? And your cousin is already six months pregnant. She goes over to see Elizabeth. Elizabeth prophesies as well that this is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ that's born of Mary. And then she stays with Elizabeth for three months 
at you know wherever they're staying in that city of Judah. I don't know if it's near Jerusalem. I don't know how far Zacharias lived from the temple, but you could assume he lived pretty close if that's that's where he's working. Now let's jump over to Matthew one. So that that is the first event, right? The first event is the angel comes to Mary and tells her she's going to give birth. She's not living with Joseph yet. She goes to uh, near Jerusalem, stays in the house of Zacharias for three months, and now she's returned back to her home. Now think about this. Like, so three months later, right, she's conceived. Now she's got a bit of a three-month bump. You know, you know three month, uh, when you're three months pregnant, that's when your stomach starts to show that you know, you're pregnant. Now keep that in mind when we read through Matthew 1. So in Matthew 1, this is now when the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph, right? So this is at least three months later, right? Three months later, or sometime within that, that three months, right? But I think it's about three months later. But we, he, the angel goes to Mary first, then goes to Joseph. So if you're wondering about the timeline of events, that's how it works. Matthew 1.18 says here, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, right? So they're espoused, they haven't slept together yet. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So this is where I think Joseph now realises, hey, well, I'm espoused to this woman, but she's pregnant, right? Because she's been three months staying near Jerusalem. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. So he didn't want to divorce her openly. He just wanted to write her a bill of divorcement and put her away. That's, that's what he was thinking, right? Verse 20, but while he thought on these things. So we can see here that Joseph, he's not somebody just to act on things quickly because he's kind of thinking, well, he probably knew that Mary was a faithful woman. You know, you know what's going on here, right? Like if she's pregnant, he hasn't obviously slept with her. So he's thinking on these things. He's thinking of divorcing her. But while he's thinking on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying, so we see here that we don't know who this angel is, right? We can assume that it's Gabriel as well, but we're not told the name of this angel, right? Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of her in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. So not only was Mary told by the angel, you know, three months ago, right, that, that she was to name the, the child Jesus, Joseph, in his visit from the angel, was also told to name the child Jesus. So they didn't get this, this name wrong. They were told by both visits to, to name the child Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. So we know, you know, comparing this to the Isaiah passage, when it says a virgin shall conceive, that when... A woman has conceived, she has a child with her. That's why abortion is murder, because you're murdering a child. Because when somebody has conceived, they are with child. And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, is, which being interpreted is God with us. So this is a great verse to show that Jesus is God, right? Because they're calling this birth of the Savior, they're calling his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 24, then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. Now, one thing I find funny, and I'll just mention at this point, is Joseph, I don't, I don't know if you realize how many times Joseph is visited in a dream. Like it's just, all these things happen while he's sleeping in terms of like they come to him and tell him what to do next. So then Joseph, being raised from sleep, so this is this angel visits him like sort of in this vision, in this dream, right? being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. Now notice, Joseph, like I said, he's also a man of faith because he gets this word of the Lord in this vision and he doesn't wait a couple of days, he doesn't wait a couple of weeks, he rises up and then he acts on it, right? He's not waiting, you know, months and days and whatnot. Like, this is what people do, right, in Christianity. They'll say, like, oh, you know, or next year, like, New Year's is coming up, right? And they'll say, well, next year I'll start reading my Bible. Or next year I'll start going soul winning. Or, or next week, you know, oh, yeah, next year that's when I'm going to start going to church more. No, that, that means that you have little faith, right? Because a man of great faith, like Joseph, they're told they know what they should be doing, you know, and then they do it straight away. Right? being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. 
and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So he was obedient to that heavenly vision, right? And, and, and called his son Jesus. Now, we see here, right, that he took his wife. So now, I believe, after Matthew 1, so they weren't living together in Luke 1. In Matthew 1, after he gets that vision, because he was thinking of putting her away privately or secretly, then, now that he's told, hey, no, what's conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost, then he takes her as his wife. So now I think he's actually taking her into his house. Now they're together, right? But they don't actually sleep together until Jesus Christ is born. So this verse 25 proves that Mary was not a perpetual virgin, right? She did end up, you know, sleeping with her husband. And this is why Jesus has half-brothers and sisters. He said he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. That means he did know her after that she had brought forth her firstborn son. So that's now the angel visiting Joseph. So we had the angel visits Mary, then the angel visits Joseph, both telling them to, to, to call the child Jesus. Ma Joseph then takes Mary into her, his house, but does not sleep with her. Now let's go into Luke 2 and we see, um, you know, why they ended up in Bethlehem. Because remember, they're living in Nazareth, right? But why did they end up in, in Bethlehem? Well, in Luke 2 we see here, Luke 2 verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. So it's interesting that, you know, that, the, that everyone knew that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem even though the parents were in Nazareth. But it turns out that this Caesar ends up putting out this decree that everyone should be taxed. And this is the reason why they end up going back down to Bethlehem, because that's where Joseph's inheritance um, uh, was, was actually situated, even though he was living in Nazareth. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. So Bethlehem is the city of David, right? Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. So we see here that when you're espoused to somebody, they are your wife. Being great with child. So that gives us a hint into this timeline, right, of when they ended up moving from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. Because remember, she, when she conceived, she went to Elizabeth. She was there for three months. That's probably then when Joseph found her pregnant and was thinking of putting her away. But he gets the vision from the angel. He takes her into his house. And now a cu another couple of months, you can say, which has passed. She, she may be at you know, eight months. Who knows? You know, eight and a half months. And now because of this taxing, they have to travel and move uh, down to Jerusalem, which is, or down to Bethlehem, right, which is just underneath Jerusalem. So that's where they were living. This is where Judea is, Jerusalem, the capital city, right? And then Bethlehem is just south of um, Jerusalem. Let's continue. Luke 2. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So this is where we get this scene where they're in the stable because the manger is this trough, right, that the animals would feed out of. And because there was no room, there was no beds for them in the inn. That's why they wrapped baby Jesus in the swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger. And that's why you always see that nativity scene with the hay, you know, trying to make itself and the baby in there. But oftentimes he's not swaddled, right? He's just sort of lying in there open. And he always has like long blonde hair because the Catholics, I don't know, they want to make Jesus like this long haired, blonde haired, blue eyed person. But no, no, he's swaddled there. And it's important because this is the sign that the shepherds are given to say, this is how you'll know that, it's, that it's the Messiah because he's not in a hospital, he's not in the inn, he's actually in the stable, in the manger, swaddled in cloths. Luke 2, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. So these shepherds are in the same location in Bethlehem, right? They're probably nearby and they're, they're keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. So they get this bright, this bright flash. They're in the field, keeping over their flock by night. Imagine this flash happening, you know, this bright light that's coming, and this angel comes to visit them. And again, we don't know whether this angel was also the angel Gabriel, and it's, but that's a possibility, right? The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. Right. So this is how they know they need to go to Bethlehem to see this thing. Right. Because he's told, they're told by the angel, in the city of David, a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. You'll notice in the nativity scene at Roselands, that's what they've removed, right? They've removed, whenever you see this nativity scene, it always says, On earth, peace and goodwill toward men. But is, you know, they're missing out the most important point, that it was glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace goodwill towards men. So the main message of the angel was not just you know, peace and goodwill toward men. No, it was that, that God would be glorified is the first thing they said, and then it was peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I wanted to just stop on verse 12 here, where it says, the sign to the shepherds is that he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Now, I just need to mention this to you, because my wife and I were watching this last night. But there was this ser there's this series that's getting put out by VidAngel and, and this, this Christian director um, called The Chosen. And The Chosen is meant to be like this TV series um, that's, that's basically from the point of view of other characters in the story, right? Kind of like um, there was this movie that recently came out. I haven't watched it, but it's supposedly it's like the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the Roman soldier's point of view. And, and, and people are trying to like sort of make this story, which... You know, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with it, but the, the risk of trying to tell these other stories that are not mentioned in the Bible is that they end up getting a lot of things wrong, right? But what's interesting about this Chosen series is that they, they're trying to say that, you know, uh, this, you know they, they, they're saying that they can't trust Hollywood to make this TV series because look at what they did with Noah and look at what they've done with Exodus and look at what they've done with all these other biblical movies. No, they, they want to make this biblical movie just right and right on what the Bible says. And you even have people like Ravi Zacharias. You guys know Ravi Zacharias, right? That in, is he Indian or something? Or Pakistani guy? That, that is an apologist and these scholars and he's endorsing it saying like oh you know the, these these videos are, they're, they're going to be biblically accurate and they're going to be a blessing to you and all that sort of stuff and i don't doubt that the, the the acting might be powerful and there are elements of it that are true but i watched the pilot episode which was like this 20 minute episode and it was called the shepherd and basically it was from the point of view of one of the shepherds living in that town and his experience with the pharisees and, you know, these were the shepherds that were providing the sheep for the sacrifice and whatnot. And he was one of the shepherds in the field that sort of see this angel and then they go and see Jesus. But, you know, when they go to see Jesus, this is, this is what frustrates me when they say they're trying to make these shows so biblically accurate because there are just obvious things that they completely miss. Because these shepherds, they go to see Jesus, right, after they get this vision from this angel. And then they, they come to Mary and Joseph and then Jesus is being held by Mary, right? He's not in a manger. And I'm just thinking that's one of the main parts of the story in verse 12. It says, how you know that this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born in the flesh, is that you'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, not being held by Mary, right? But in the show, that's how it's portrayed. It's portrayed that they come and Mary is holding her baby and then it's like, oh, his name's Jesus. So it just, it just frustrates me that, you know, th this story, I mean, it's written here. You don't have to write, you don't have to rewrite the script. I mean, it's here. You just have to read, you don't have to be a scholar to know that when the shepherds went to see Jesus, that's how they found him and that's how they knew it was Jesus. But, you know, these movies and these shows, they claim that they try and make it so accurate and they've got all the scholars and they've got all the Jewish rabbis, you know, making sure it's all so accurate, but they just miss out these obvious 
things. And when you, when you watch the show, that's the first thing that came to my mind is if the shepherds are going to go there, they're going to find Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, like the angel said. But that's not how they find uh, Mary and Joseph in that show. Let's continue. So in Luke 2, it says, And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So what were they telling everybody when they saw Jesus lying in the manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes? What were they telling everyone? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. See, so they went out preaching that the Saviour was born. And that's what we ought to do, right? When we see Jesus, we learn about Jesus, we ought to be telling others that a Saviour is here, that there is a Saviour born and able to save us. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Now, when we read on in Luke 2, right, that we see here that after Jesus is brought to the temple, they return to Nazareth. And when Jesus, and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So that's going back to the vision, right? That, the, or not the vision, the, the visit that Mary had of the angel in Luke 1. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now I just wanted to just, I forgot to, to mention here in Luke 2, um, see in verse 15 here, it says, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. So remember what I mentioned at the beginning in the nativity scene, a lot of people have angels in their nativity scene. But see, the angels weren't at that location, right? When they went to go see Jesus. So a nativity scene is accurate if the shepherds are there seeing Jesus, right? Because they actually saw the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And you might have the sheep in the stable or what the shepherds there, you know, looking at Jesus, Mary and Joseph there as well. But there were no angels there, right? And there were no wise men there. It was just the angels. So that's the right nativity scene. So there was no angels there. They went and preached that in the city of David, um, um, a saviour was born. Uh, and then we see here, after they went, they returned back to the field, right? Glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them, what? That, that they would see this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Then they take Jesus, right? After eight days to go and have him circumcised in the temple, Right? So they, they go there, as it written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. So this is where we learn that the family of Jesus was a poor family because in Leviticus 12, when we're given the law of purification for women, she was meant to bring a lamb, right, for the sacrifice. But if she's not able to, then she brings a pair of of turtle doves or two young pigeons if they aren't able to afford the lamb. So we see here that Jesus was born into a poor family, not into a rich family. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon them. So, in Luke 2, remember they were taxed, so they were living up here, then they had to go be taxed when Mary was great with child. They were in Bethlehem, and then that's when the shepherds come and visit Jesus. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Then eight days later, they go to Jerusalem to the temple to present him, circumcise him. That's when he's called Jesus, right? And then after those days are accomplished, all we read in Matthew is it says they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. 
Now, if you just read Matthew, right, and just read that passage, you would think, well, after eight days, maybe a couple of days later, maybe a couple of weeks later, they just left Jerusalem or Bethlehem and went straight back to Nazareth. But that's not how it works, right? Because in Luke 2, that's when we learn about the wise men and we learn about why they actually returned back to Nazareth. And it wasn't just right after Jesus was circumcised. There was actually a lot of events that happened between those two verses, right? Where it says, and they performed all things according to the law of the Lord. They returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. So yes, it was after they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, but it wasn't just a couple of days or a couple of weeks later, which it might seem like if you just read Luke 2. So let's go to Matthew 2 and we'll finish on the wise men. This is the last passage we're going through. And we'll learn about the wise men and see the true Christmas story here of, of the wise men. Matthew 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So first of all, you want to note that these are not kings. Wise men are not kings. You remember in the book of Daniel, Daniel was one of the wise men. He wasn't the king, right? He was just one of the nobles, one of the advisors. So these are advisors or nobles in from, from the east coming over. The other thing you need to note as well is we don't know the number of the wise men. It's always mentioned that there are three. The reason why they always use three to represent the wise men is because they gave the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. So they usually they have one person holding each, right? And then it just stays in people's minds that there was three, as well as that song, We Three Kings of Orient Are. So number one, we don't know that there were three and they weren't kings. They were wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So if you look at the map, I mean, I guess they're coming from over here somewhere, right? And they're traveling over to, to Jerusalem. Saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So I have a feeling that the star appeared when Jesus was born, right? And then they were coming over to, to visit him because they're obviously tr taking a bit longer to travel over. But when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. So he's worried that this king of the Jews is coming because I guess he's worried that his authority is going to be usurped, right? Because he's the king right now. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So isn't it interesting that it's no secret where the Savior was going to be born. The king demands, hey, where is Christ going to be born? And they can tell him instantly, hey, it's going to be in Bethlehem, right? Because that's what the scriptures say. Then Herod, right, when he had privily or secretly called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. So it's not that they, see, we don't know how long they were traveling, but obviously the star appeared, they started traveling. So what Herod is asking them now is like, when did this star appear? Why? Because he's trying to, if he knows Christ is born in Bethlehem, he's trying to gauge how old this baby might be. Like, did the star appear six months ago? Did the, did the star appear a year and a half ago? So this is what he's trying to gauge, right? He's trying to gauge, engage, uh, he's trying to gauge how old this child might be. And then he says, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. So now he's trying to trick them into saying, Hey, once you find him, come back and tell me where he is because, you know, he wants to go and worship him as well. Obviously he's trying to trick them because he wants to have um, Jesus killed. Uh, so I just had that there to say, like, you know, where, um, where they were. So in Matthew 2, verse 9, When they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, I don't know if this was some supernatural star or whether it's, you know, people say it's just some star in the sky. You know, did the star actually somehow descend and, and actually stand over the house? Or did they just keep following this, this, this star? I'm not too sure, but, you know, if, it, if there was a star that, that was over the house, um, you know, I don't see what the problem with that is. Uh, when they had heard the king, uh, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. 
Now look at this. And when they were come into the house. So remember I said at the beginning, like these, these nativity scenes often have the shepherds on one side and the three kings on the other. We know now that there's not necessarily three, that they're wise men, that they're not kings. So they shouldn't have crowns and whatnot. Um, and the shepherds, no, when, when the, when the uh, wise men come to visit Jesus, this is long after the stable. This is, this is after he's been circumcised eight days later. They are now in a house with their baby. So we don't know whether this is six months later, possibly one year later. We know it couldn't be two years later, right? Because of this story here. But sometime in that period, that's when the wise men show up in Jerusalem. Right? And they're looking for Jesus. They are sent down to Bethlehem, just south of Jerusalem, to look for that child. They're following this star. And then they come into this house right, to see Jesus. So this is a completely another scene. right? They were coming to the house. They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And some people believe these are representative of different roles that Jesus has, you know, as our saviour and whatnot, as a king and as our priest and whatnot. So now they have to flee to Egypt, right? So we continue in Matthew 2. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they, had, and when they were departed, and uh, that's why I underline this, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So you remember in, when we were reading in Luke, remember how after the days of the law were fulfilled, you know, according to the law were fulfilled, they returned back to Nazareth. So now we know that's not exactly how it worked straight away. They didn't just, you know, after they circumcised Jesus, return to Nazareth, because what happens is the wise men come to visit them in Bethlehem, right? They're looking for him in Bethlehem. Um, they come to him and they're in a house and then after they leave, right, because they're warned of God in a dream not to go back to Herod because Herod's going to try and kill Jesus, they go back to the east another way, right? They don't go back to Jerusalem. And then that night, right, when they leave, Joseph has a dream, like right? he, has, he has another vision where the angel says to him, hey, you've got to flee and go into Egypt because Herod's going to come looking for Jesus to kill him. When he arose, so you see here again, remember in Matthew 1 when Joseph, he was wondering whether to marry, uh, whether to take Mary as his wife. After he gets that visit from the angel, he arises, he does straight away. Again, we see here that he gets this word from the angel. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, right? So he doesn't even wait till the morning. He goes straight away and flees into Egypt and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So there's a scripture that says that Jesus will be called out of Egypt, and this is the reason why, because they fled to Egypt to flee Herod. Now, if you're wondering where Egypt is compared to Israel, it's that direction, so it's over here, right? So they were in Bethlehem, right? Jerusalem is where the wise men came to, to talk to King Herod. He sent the wise men down to Bethlehem, they departed another way, right? So I guess they're not going back there before they go over to the east. They must be going that way or, yeah, they probably went that way, right, to, to skip Jerusalem because that would have been too long <laughs> going around the Dead Sea. And then they pick up and they flee to Egypt, right? So now they're living over here until Herod dies. Then when Herod, then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, right, was exceeding wrath and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under. Why two years old and under? According to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So remember how when he was with the wise men, he asked, hey, what time did the star appear? Right? So they would have said, oh, maybe six months ago or whatever, a couple of months ago. Then he's waiting for the wise men to come back, but then they never come back. Right? So... It has to be sometime within that two-year period, probably shorter, but maybe he's just killing every baby under two years old just to make sure, right? So he then says, you know, well, let's just kill every baby under two years old in Bethlehem and around the coast thereof because he's just trying to wipe Jesus out. 
And this is why they had to flee to Egypt. They didn't just flee to another town because Herod was coming after them uh, in, a, in a large sort of uh, net fashion, right? Then was fulfilled, which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. What a, what a tragic event. You know, like, just, just imagine, just, it's like in the days of Moses, right, when they were just trying to kill all these babies. Can you imagine how wicked King Herod is to just send people in and just say, any child under two years old, just wipe them out because we don't know who the Savior is, so we're just going to kill them all. Um, but when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. So this is now the third time. This is why I just find it funny that Joseph just keeps getting approached in these dreams. And, and, and at first it's good news, but now it's like constantly bad news, right? Because he's like, hey, you better flee. And, and you know, here he's like saying, okay, now you can go back. It's good news again. I just wonder, did, does, did, did Joseph ever get to the point where he was like worried about having a dream because he don't know what, doesn't know what's going to happen next, right? So every time he goes to sleep and he's dreaming, he's told something new is going to happen. Uh, but when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. So we don't know how long they were in Egypt for, how long Herod took to die, right? But he arose... And took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Egypt. Again, a show of Joseph's faith, right? Where he gets his dream again. Just he, he rises up from sleep and he's on his way, right? He doesn't wait to obey the word of the Lord. He just obeys the word of the Lord straight away. And he arose and took the young child and his mother, came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, so Archelaus is Herod's son. So they actually thinking of returning back, right, from Egypt, they're going to return back to Bethlehem, right, or back to, to this region of Judea. Pro maybe because they still had things there. Because remember, when they, when they had to flee into Egypt, it was kind of like the, the, they were in a house, remember? And then the wise men left, and then they had to flee straight away. So maybe they left everything there. They had a house maybe to come, to come back to. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream. Again, right? So he's, he's going there and again he's sleeping. He said, don't go to, to, to back to Bethlehem. He turned aside into the parts of Galilee and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So now you know why, you know, it says after they'd done all the things that were fulfilled in the law, they returned to Nazareth. Now you know in Luke, that's not the full story because in Matthew we learn about the wise men because while they were in Bethlehem, Herod, the wise men came to visit them and then Herod came down to kill those children. They had to flee into Egypt. Now after Herod died, they were going to go back in to Bethlehem. But because Archelaus, who was Herod's son was reigning there. They were worried that there wasn't safe there, right? Being warned of God in a dream. They didn't go back to Bethlehem, right? They're traveling back. They instead went back up to Nazareth. And in doing so, that actually fulfilled the prophecy that Jesus would be called a Nazarene, right? Because remember when Jesus came on the scene, people were saying, isn't he, isn't he of Nazareth? Isn't he born in, in Nazareth? Doesn't it say that the Savior will be born in Bethlehem? But it was because of the taxing that brought them down to Bethlehem. So that's interesting. So I hope now you can see the whole story, right? Now it sort of gives, now you know the timeline because you probably knew, oh, you know, angels visiting, dreams are happening, why they in Egypt, when's the wise? Now you know how it all fits together, right? A visit, angel visits Mary, she goes to visit Elizabeth, she comes back, angel visits Joseph, then Joseph thinks about divorcing her, takes her as to his wife, and then they, you know, they, the, the taxing happens, which brings them down to Bethlehem, right? That's when she gives birth. When they're there, the shepherds come, right? And they see Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. That's the true nativity scene. No angels, no wise men. Then after he's circumcised, they're living in Bethlehem. The wise men come to, from the east to Jerusalem, Go, uh, go, are told to go find him in Bethlehem. Then Joseph has that dream where he has to flee into Egypt. Herod comes to come kill all the babies under two years old. Then after Herod dies, they think about coming back into Jerusalem or Judea, right, into Bethlehem. 
but they're warned of God not to because Archelaus, Herod's son, rules there, and that's why they go back up to Nazareth and it fulfills the prophecy that Jesus would be called a Nazarene, right? Not a Nazarite, because a lot of people think Jesus had long hair because they think he was a Nazarite. No, no, he didn't have the Nazarite vow. He was a Nazarene, meaning that he, he was called a Nazarene because he grew up in Nazareth, as opposed to being a Nazarite, which is what Samson was. Samson was a lifelong Nazarite, right? And that's why he had the long locks of hair. So what's the conclusion, right? So we're just back in here. You know, I hope, you know, it will probably take a long time before people of the world, right, and people of Christians of Australia realise the true story and can see the false nativity scenes that are out there. But at least this church will now know, you know, what is wrong with the nativity scene. So concluding thoughts, right? Don't perpetuate the lie of Santa Claus you know, you know, if, if you're going to celebrate Christmas and remember the birth of Jesus, make it about Jesus. You know, if you're going to make some nativity scene, now you can make it accurate, right? But don't perpetuate the Santa Claus, the reindeer. Don't spend your money, which ultimately belongs to God. Don't spend it promoting lies and perpetuating lies. That's why I will never buy any of that Christmas, you know, Santa Claus, reindeer, elves. I'll never, you know, buy my child and elf onesie you know in christmas that sort of thing um you know don't perpetuate this lie of santa claus and reindeers and all that sort of stuff you know only shepherds were in the stable remember jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in the manger there's no angels at the nativity scene you know i don't believe angels have wings you know you can prove that to me but i, I don't think they do you know they look like men they're not these little babies with wings and arrows um, we don't know how many wise men there were they weren't kings and they found Jesus in a house, you know, maybe about a, six months to a year later. And, you know, Joseph is probably terrified of sleeping because he doesn't know what's going to happen, what's going to happen next. Anyways, I hope you learned something there and, and now know the true story. All right, let's, uh, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for uh, being born into this world and dying on the cross for us. Um, we thank you, Lord, that you give us the true story of Christmas. And I pray, Lord, that this, that your word would protect us from false doctrine, would protect us from teaching lies to our children. And I pray, Lord, that as we try to teach our children the truths of your word, that we would make sure these things are corrected, Lord, at least in our families. Um, pray that you give us wisdom to raise our children. And we love you, Lord. We, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing uh, one more song and then uh, we will have dinner together for you guys that are staying. All right, let's sing uh, this song. Hallelujah, what a saviour. Hallelujah, what a saviour. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Saviour. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Saviour. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a Saviour. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a saviour. 
When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring, then anew this song will sing, Hallelujah, what a Saviour. Amen.